So folks, Merrick Garland just made a gargantuan move and it's not getting nearly enough attention for how important it is and how direct a blow it's going to be, not only for old Donnie, but also for his corrupt crony Judge Cannon, as Garland not only puts the screws to them through a recent filing, but also signaling, and a bunch of legal experts agree, how his next move is not only going to embarrass Cannon, not only humiliate her, not only chastise her and scold her for all of the BS she's allowing to happen in her court, but critically fire her from the equation entirely and take the case from her entirely when it matters most. First, I want to get into the fact that what Garland has also done and what we've also seen is that we now know more and now Trump knows that Garland knows more about the recent investigation. Then we're going to get into how his recent filing absolutely sliced and diced cannon and how everyone else is doing it at the same time and then critically I want to get in to his next plan his secret plan to remove cannon and stop her from doing any more damage again when it matters most the news in the case of classified documents seized from Florida Devlin Barrett at the Washington Post reports this some of the classified documents recovered by the FBI from Donald Trump's Mar-a-Lago home and private club included highly sensitive intelligence regarding Iran and China, according to people familiar with the matter. If shared with others, the people said, such information could expose intelligence gathering methods that the United States wants to keep hidden from the world. Now, NBC News has not confirmed this reporting, but Joyce, from a legal standpoint, does it up the ante in any way? Well, I do think it's important to note that we don't know exactly what this information entails and, and whether it's precisely what's being reported. The sourcing is unclear on that. If it were to be information of this type, it would be extremely serious. And Chris, you know, we've had this conversation in the past that when DOJ is considering whether it will indict and charge someone in a case like this, they're looking for plus factors. And one of those plus factors can involve very cavalier treatment of extremely important information. And so the evidence in this case gets worse for the former president. Not only did he obstruct and try to lie to DOJ and try to hang on to these documents long after he knew that they needed to go back. Of course, the evidence suggests he knew that from the get go. But now we're learning that this is the sort of uh, information that could really compromise national security and relationship with other nations if it fell into the wrong hands. Andrew Weissman, let me begin with you and what we have learned about the Trump lawyers and the special master process based on what the Justice Department filing reveals to us about what they are calling the disputes over these documents. Uh, it seems to me that that this reveals that the Trump lawyers never had any kind of a hint of a strategy of what this special master process was supposed to do for them. That's totally right. And uh, you also read from a footnote where the Department of Justice, when it talks about the fact that there are personal documents that are seized every single day of the week uh, at the federal and state level, that's their footnote that very politely is saying, I don't know why Judge Cannon even cares about this category, because we were allowed to seize and we do seize every day personal documents. So you might want to put this into the category of a personal document, but it's irrelevant because we still get to keep it. Um, that was this their very polite way of saying, like, none of this makes any sense. My favorite of the sort of lunacy of the Trump position is where he says that clemency petitions are personal documents. And to me, you don't have to be Sigmund Freud to understand what's going on here, which is that for Donald Trump, that is exactly the way he viewed clemency, not as a government function, but as something that was doled out to people like Steve Bannon and to other cronies like Michael Flynn. And it was done entirely on a personal basis. But unfortunately for him, uh, he decided that he wanted a special master and he has a real judge. It is going to take, um, you know, we were in New York. It's going to take less than a New York minute for Judge Deary to rule on 
um, these issues. They're, they really seem quite frivolous. Uh, and it will be an interesting night when we discover uh, who w- whose name <clears throat> was in that clemency document that Donald Trump calls personal in this inventory of documents. Uh, Harry Lippman, what did you get from reading the Justice Department's filing in their table of all these documents and disputes? Well, since we're picking favorites, I'll go with six and seven, where Mm -hmm. Donald Trump says that a record that is personal is somehow (laughs) also an official record of the government. That is so clearly the null set. But there are two arguments in here. I agree with Andrew that Deary should make quick work of them. Then we'll see what Cannon does. But the 11th Circuit obviously ought to be the backstop here. One is where he basically asserts implicitly that he can take a document that was government uh driven and related, wave his hand and make it personal after his presidency. That should be a loser. Even more importantly, there are two documents where he says he has executive uh, privilege and the um, DOJ gives it back of the hand. And you would think Deary would as well, because for, there are several reasons. The one you gave at the end was that it would, even if there were executive privilege, it would have to yield because it's important to an ongoing investigation. But you can't have an executive privilege against the executive. And they put it in very sort of summary form in the table itself. I expect Deary, who's already said, where's the beef? I mean, uh, you can't have your cake and eat it too. We'll have some other uh, cute slogan to, to dispense with that claim. And that's really the big one because because as Andrew says, there was no need for a special master in the first place. But the real mischief has always been the possibility that Judge Cannon would do something awry on executive privilege. I think Deary will give that back of the hand and the 11th Circuit, if it comes to it, also will. What we just saw there is, you know, a real confirmation that this is more and more serious. And obviously we're getting some of this info from sources, maybe within the DOJ or that. No. And it could be the case that they want people to know something. Obviously, they never wanted the documents taken, but maybe it's important that the people understand, the public understand just how serious the crimes Donald Trump is, is, are being accused of. That it's not simply taking random classified documents that people don't understand. People can understand why documents related to adversarial countries and their weapons programs may be something we don't want people to just see at a golf club, a country club down in South Florida. I think that's even the regular non, you know, news watching person every day will understand that. But then we get into how Garland and his team absolutely crushed Cannon, crushed her like a can of Coke, if you will, on the sidewalk, because what they did was demonstrate that she's been giving Trump special treatment and they don't buy it and Deary doesn't buy it and the 11th doesn't buy it. Nobody buys it. And here's where the next move comes in. And it comes into what we talked about a couple days ago with Cash Patel, because remember, he was hauled into a grand jury. Maybe it was against his will. We don't know how much he participated We don't ultimately know if he betrayed Donald Trump, but what we do know is it was in D.C. And the whole point of Garland's next move to remove Cannon, to fire her from the equation, can't fire her from the bench, but to effectively remove her from this case is to switch the jurisdiction. Because the way it normally works is that when you stay within a jurisdiction and a case continues, you stay with the same judge if the case is related. And there's no way you want to remain with Cannon. So, Garland is switching it up and bringing it to D.C. because all of these grand juries happening in D.C. means that when he indicts, he's likely to do it there. And that's what the experts are noting. It says here and it says Patel's inner inner circle for Trump when it comes to Mar-a-Lago investigation. Note the location of that federal grand jury. The District of Columbia goes to where DOJ is more likely to bring an indictment, not in Florida. Goodman's thread was noted by Harvard law professor Lawrence Tribe when he said a great thread. Trump's indictment in D.C. Note the venue is on its way. Former DOJ spokesperson Matthew Miller also noted the location of the grand jury. Safe to say we can retire the notion DOJ was only interested in getting the docs back and nothing more. So that's at least three top legal experts. Three people with more than a hundred years of experience maybe when you put it all together. Certainly generations collectively of experience all noting the venue 
which is that Cannon has to be removed. You got to remove her from this case. You got to fire her from the equation. You got to, you know, you can't impeach her, unfortunately. You can't just fire her in total, but you got to get rid of her. So you're going to beat her in court now. You're going to beat her in all the appeals. And then when it comes down to it, you're going to indict in D.C. far away from Cannon where she can't save Donald Trump anymore. That's the plan to neutralize Trump and his crony judge, again, when it matters most, because this case around the documents and privilege matters, but it's ultimately a delay tactic. When it comes time to actually charge, this judge won't be there to save him, and Garland just made sure of it.